discussion, debate, democracy. This is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Press Club for today's National Australia Bank Address. This is, of course, our last National Australia Bank Address for the year, and it's fitting that just 24 hours after a ministerial reshuffle, our guest should be a senior cabinet minister, indeed a member of the Gillard, Gov Gillard Government uh, Leadership Group. Uh, of course, he's not here today to talk about the reshuffle, but no doubt there'll be plenty of time for that during questions. He is here today to discuss the National Broadband Network, uh, its uh, implementation. Please welcome the Minister for uh, Broadband, Communication Communications Digital Economy, Senator Stephen Conroy. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I should start by apologising. I'm sure many of you went to those first 68 and thought we're finished for the year. And then Conroy decided he wanted to come and talk. So apologies for interrupting your Christmas festivities, which you'd probably be rather doing than here today. But today I am here to talk to you about the Gillard government's world-class national broadband network. The NBN stands as an example of this government's determination to build the Australian economy's long-term future. And I want to outline the significant progress that we have made this year and what we can look forward to next year. I'll talk about why we need the NBN. The NBN, as has already been mentioned, is the largest infrastructure project this country has ever seen. We're embarking on this project because broadband is a serious issue and the Labor Party treats it as such. It stands in stark contrast to the narrow and negative approach of the Coalition this year. 2011 has been a great year of progress for the NBN. Eight first release sites across Australia now have customers connected. Over 18,000 premises have been passed by fibre and over 3,000 customers are now today connected to the National Broadband Network. Construction contracts have been agreed for the rollout in every state and territory. And in June, the government and NBN Co reached an historic agreement with Telstra. The deal means a more efficient and cost-effective rollout and less disruption for local communities. The deal will also deliver significant reforms to the sector, including the structural separation of Telstra. And in October, 99.45% of Telstra shareholders voted in favour of the NBN deal. And we have seen real progress in the regions and in the bush. NBN Co has signed a deal worth $1.1 billion dollars with Ericsson for the rollout of the fixed wireless network in rural Australia. The interim satellite service is up and running with over a thousand customers in the most underserved parts of Australia. They are now receiving a better standard of broadband than many in metropolitan Australia. Meanwhile, the long-term satellite service will see us build and launch two satellites by 2015. These satellites will use the next generation technology to deliver the best possible broadband services to isolated parts of Australia. The fifth and final link of the government's regional backbone black spots program will be switched on before Christmas. And NBN Co has announced a 12-month rollout program that covers 485,000 premises. Early next year, the three-year rollout plan will be released. And what you will see is fibre to be built in safe Labor seats, safe Liberal seats, marginal seats and any other kind of seat you can imagine. But there is one type of seat we won't be building it in, and that is any Liberal Party seats in Tasmania. Sorry to Paul Fletcher. It has been a big year, and the NBN is today very much a reality. The NBN means jobs and opportunities 
for our economy. Around $3.5 billion of NBN Co's procurement involves local content. The physical rollout will create up to 18,000 direct jobs around the country. It's no surprise that only Labor takes communications policy seriously, if you look back through history. The ALP is proud of its commitment to communications in Australia. It was the Whitlam Labor government that implemented the separation of Post and Telecom in 1975. Labor established the concept of these authorities trading as business entities. Labor corporatised Telecom and introduced retail service competition. But yet, yes, mistakes in this sector have been made. They stretched over 20 years and been over two governments. And these were compounded, these mistakes, by the Howard government selling Telstra without securing any structural separation. Telstra earned 65% of the industry's revenue and most importantly, 90% of the profits. Structurally, the industry was broken. In this century, it has been Labor that has developed a contemporary communications policy. Only the NBN addresses the poor state of broadband services, the need for a ubiquitous long-term solution and the requirement for structural reform. The Coalition offers none of these. Instead, they have a critique of the NBN framed in the same way as a response to another policy issue that many of you will be familiar with, climate change. Strategy has three simple steps. First, they say there isn't a problem. Second, they say the government's proposal won't work or is too expensive. And finally, they propose a plan that fails to deliver for our future needs. Now, the first claim they make is that there's no problem. Malcolm Turnbull has consistently asked what is wrong with what people have got today? As opposition leader, he said, I've got an XG wireless card in my laptop, and when I was in Mackay yesterday, I was getting 3.5 megabits. That allows me to do everything that I need to do. Well, congratulations, Malcolm. Congratulations. But he didn't stop there. Last year, he questioned the need for speeds above 12 megabits. And this is what he said. He said, you tell me, what are the great productivity enhancements that cannot be accessed by 12 megabits? Well, let's just look at some facts. There continues to be a dramatic growth in the volume of data moving around the internet and in demand for broadband speeds. And a number of charts illustrate this, and you can see them here. And this chart shows how evolving technology has increased download speeds exponentially since 1985. Download speed requirements have increased at 25 to 35 per cent per year, per year, for more than two decades. The next chart shows these downloaded speeds trends over time. And as you can see, the trend of exponential growth in download speeds has been consistent. Just as dial-up rapidly became insufficient for our needs, so too will copper-based technologies become insufficient very soon. I've talked about download speeds, and Malcolm likes to talk about download speeds, but broadband communication is two-way. It requires capacity to send information or upload as well as to receive information. Our broadband infrastructure today has severely limited upload capacity. High, speed up, high upload speeds are vital for applications that use high definition video conferencing. These are applications that will transform many aspects of our lives. They will impact the way we educate our children and consult with our doctors. High upload speeds are also vital for small businesses. Small businesses increasingly need to send large files and do so from many locations, including the home. And a key feature of the MBN, 
is that fibre gives you the capacity to use all of these applications. And the capacity to use them with more than one device and more than one user at a time. Now the second fact is about fixed line networks and how they continue to play a crucial role in our broadband landscape. This chart from, from Cisco shows that global IP traffic is forecast to quadruple, quadruple between 2010 and 2015. The volume of data over the internet is growing at a compound rate of 32% annually. This will place increasing strains on our existing broadband infrastructure. Now, the orange at the top of the bars represents mobile connections. And it is true, the number of wireless broadband subscriptions is skyrocketing, as many Australians are taking up smartphones and tablets. Many of you here, I'm sure, own two or three or even more of these devices. So the volume of mobile connections will continue to grow significantly. Yet, fixed line connections, the dark and light blue bars, will continue to do the lion's share of data transfer. What's important to note is that the light blue bars represent Wi-Fi. Now, Wi-Fi are short distance wireless connections commonly found in our homes, offices, cafes and airports that are linked to a fixed line. So the next time you hear Malcolm or Joe Hockey or Tony Abbott talking about how they're sitting at the airport using their laptops or using their iPads and iPhones, the more likely chance is they're using a Wi-Fi network. And why is that important? Why am I making this point? We use Wi-Fi networks to connect our smartphones, tablets, laptops to the internet, but these are not mobile connections. They are, in fact, using a fixed line connection. Do not misunderstand me. Mobile networks have an important and vital role to play in our broadband future. They are complementary to fixed line broadband networks, but they are not going to replace fixed line networks. In summary, we will continue to need greater and greater capacity in our broadband infrastructure, and we remain heavily dependent on fixed line networks. But according to Mr Turnbull, there is no problem. Why do we need to change? He simply denies that the growth you see in these charts will occur. So the second part of the coalition strategy is to claim that the government's policy is too expensive or won't work. Mr Turnbull continues to misrepresent the project's true cost. First, he announced operating, he confused operating expenses with capital expenses by including lease payments to Telstra in the capital costs. That's where the $50 billion comes from. More recently, he's tried to add capex for replacement and upgrades after the network is built to the construction cost. And just last week, he claimed to have found another $6 billion in operating expenses. And when I found Mike Quigley the other day, I said, Mike, can you remotely work out where he's got these numbers from? And he said, look, we can't. We, we actually can't find, we don't understand what he was saying. So Mr Turnbull claims he knows more about MBNCO's books and its expenses and the company itself. But on top of all of these misrepresentations, Mr Turnbull also used misleading comparisons with other countries. For example, some of you may have been here in this room when he suggested that New Zealand was delivering fibre to the home more cheaply than Australia. He did so by again misrepresenting the investment sums. He referred to the total project capex for Australia, the whole of Australia, for all three technologies we're using, wireless, satellite and uh, fixed, across 100% of the country. And in doing so, he then used again his fictitious $50 billion capex figure. And then he compared it with the New Zealand government's contribution for fibre covering only 75% of New Zealand, a much smaller place. He's also misleading about the affordability of MBN services. And this was particularly entertaining during the course of the year. Mr Turnbull has said, and I quote, the NBN will increase retail prices. And he promotes wild claims about NBN co-prices. He often cites, as do some newspapers, Henry Ergas, an economics consultant to Mr Turnbull when he was leader, who claimed a couple of years ago the NBN would cost users more than $200 a month. Remember those? 
$200 a month. Yet the fact is, retail pricing over the NBN today is broadly in line with, and in many cases, cheaper than current ADSL prices. Today, for example, NBN packages start from $30 to $34.50 per month. And what's important to keep remembering is there's no $30 line rental on top of that. That's it. $34 per month for one of the base products from one of the national providers. For $37.50 per month, you can purchase a 25 meg down and 5 meg service, which is superior to anything available today on copper. Now, the independent consumer website, Whistle Out, recently looked at all of the plans, ADSL2 Plus plans and the NBN plans, and found that entry-level NBN prices were between 23 and 43 per cent lower than comparable ADSL2 Plus plans. Furthermore, NBN Co has committed to the ACCC that wholesale prices will decrease in real terms over time. Further, the price for entry-level services will be frozen for five years. So I'm hoping a debate about how expensive to consumers that the NBN is going to be can be put to bed just with some simple facts. The third part of the coalition's strategy is to suggest alternative plans that fail to deliver for our future needs. It is actually a little difficult to work out exactly what Mr Turnbull is proposing. He has variously suggested using a mix of technologies including HFC, wireless and fibre to the node. So excuse me and apologies for this, I'm going to have to get a little bit technical to explain some of the limitations of Mr Turnbull's plans. The centrepiece of Mr Turnbull's plan seems to be fibre to the node. But Mr Turnbull continues to be misleading or deliberately uh, ill-informed when he talks about the capacity of FTTN. Mr Turnbull has stated many times that download speeds of 60 or 80 megabits are feasible over copper. However, the speeds you can achieve over copper depend on how the copper network was built. The diameter of the copper and the length of the copper lines severely restricts the speeds achievable in Australia. And that's the first limitation of broadband over copper. To achieve the speeds Mr Turnbull speaks of over FTTN requires bonded copper pairs, which means simply using at least two copper lines per connection. Australia's network has not been designed or built with two copper lines available to every premise. We simply do not have the copper availability and quality to deliver the speeds and performance that Mr Turnbull keeps claiming. I've mentioned the importance already of upload speeds. And you might notice whenever Mr Turnbull talks about FTTN, he never talks about upload speeds because FTTN is severely limited in this respect. I want to give you an example. Building FTTN, which delivers such low upload speeds, would be like building the Sydney Harbour Bridge with only one lane and in only one direction and then making people row a boat back across the harbour. Mr Turnbull says an FTTN build should be done in a manner which facilitates a future upgrade to FTTH. In reality, any FTTN build is a wasted investment. It involves the installation of tens of thousands of these large cabinets that you can see now. A cost-effective rollout of FTTN does not provide an efficient upgrade path for fibre to the home. This is what the experts tell you. It is not a simple matter of building fibre part of the way to the home and then building the rest later. So don't think piece of fibre to the big cabinet, copper at the moment, just pull the copper out, put fibre on, done. We've upgraded. What you can see now is that for FTTH, these much smaller and simpler, what they're called, splitter boxes, shown here on the left. Now this cabinet or node contains expensive electronics, this is the FTTN, that cannot be used in a fibre to the home build. So all of 
the electronics equipment inside those big cabinets, it's quite clear you can see, the splitters are much smaller, is a wasted investment. This means that billions of dollars invested in the technology in the nodes will be wasted when a government concludes fibre to the home is needed. And this is what the ACCC said to the expert panel that advised us on this. It's what the ACCC said about a month ago in front of the parliamentary committee. But Malcolm Turnbull just continues to ignore the facts. And you may say, oh, OK, well, let's build one anyway. So let's take a case of a government making a decision to switch from fibre to the node to fibre to the home. Where, where is the government recently that's done that? Oh, well, that's right. It's in New Zealand. Mr Turnbull, standing where I am a few months ago, put New Zealand's broadband policy on a pedestal when he said, we have been already completely and utterly outdone by our Kiwi cousins on broadband. Well, across the Tasman, New Zealand has been building a fibre to the node since 2008. However, this year, they abandoned fibre to the node in favour of fibre to the home the same technology that we are using for the NBN. So before the fibre to the node network was even completed, New Zealand decided to replace it with fibre to the home. And here's what the now uh, former reshuffles are in the air. Stephen Joyce, my counterpart, uh, is no longer the Minister for Communications, but here's his quote. The future of broadband is in fibre and taking it right to the home will bring significant gains for productivity, innovation and global reach. And he went on to say, ultra-fast broadband is a key part of the government's economic growth plan. Broadband speeds of 100 megabits and more will revolutionise the way many businesses operate. So unlike our opposition, New Zealand's Conservative government understands the importance of super-fast broadband infrastructure. So yes, Mr Turnbull, New Zealand does have it right. FTTN is inadequate. So Mr Turnbull's moved on from some of the FTN debate recently and he's talked about HFC, another technology he suggested that we use. The existing HFC network is a major part of his plan to serve metropolitan Australia. Mr Turnbull claims 30% of all homes can be served by HFC. Now HFC refers to the duplicated networks of Optus and Telstra for its pay TV. It can also deliver broadband. I just wanted to play you a quick clip of what broadband would look like under Mr Turnbull's plan. This is the world Mr Turnbull wants you to live in. Laurel Lane used to be such a nice place to live. Um, everyone used to be friends in this neighborhood. But then everyone started sharing the same cable line for the internet. That's when things online got slower and people started acting, well, downright unneighborly. Every day I come into this neighborhood, I don't know what to expect. I'm scared. I used to use this mace for dogs. Occasionally you get a situation like this with the overcrowding on the internet. People try to take the law into their own hands. You gotta get into the law and go up. That's the whole point. The thing is, is these aren't bad people. That's what breaks my heart. The internet is, once again, your friend. <coughs> so, a bit of a laugh you might think, but no, this was a serious ad made 10 years ago uh, by Pacifica Bell, now AT&T, in the United States, 10 years ago. And the point that they were trying to make was stick with copper because HFC is a shared medium and it has all these problems. So the more people using it in your street, the slower it gets. And Malcolm wants 30% of Australians to be using the existing networks. When people start hogging the available capacity, there's just not enough to go around. Now I've shown you the enormous growth in demand for capacity by end users. Using HFC is a dead end solution. Let me make two further points about the limitations of HFC. Firstly, just like FTTN, Mr Turnbull will never talk about the upload speeds because it doesn't deliver significant upload speeds, two megabits. Secondly, the HFC networks are closed access. 
Retail services are only offered by the two companies that own them, Telstra and Optus. So what, about, what happened to competition, Mr Turnbull? Does the coalition plan to force the cable networks to become open access? If so, he should explain how. So after FTTN and HFC, we come to wireless. And wireless has similar yet more profound limitations than HFC. Under the NBN, Labor will deliver fibre to 93% of Australia. The last 7% outside the fibre footprint will receive a mix of fixed wireless and satellite technology. And because wireless is a shared technology, it works very well in low density areas where less people share the capacity. Now the NBN's fixed wireless network is designed to serve a specific restricted number of premises in a given area. This will allow a more consistent and reliable service. But the fact of wireless remains. The more people using it, the slower it gets. And it can be 3G, 4G, 5G or 20G. When wireless is used in areas with higher population density, this becomes a serious constraint. That is why wireless and fixed line are complementary technologies. Furthermore, mobile data usage is more expensive than fixed. And this is reflected in the relative prices for mobile and fixed line broadband plans. An analysis conducted in March of this year by Market Clarity said that mobile internet access remains far more expensive than fixed broadband. And Market Clarity found mobile broadband data can be between 27 and 1,300 times more expensive than data over fixed broadband. So as we will see in a moment, it is hard to know what the real coalition plan for wireless is. In summary, Mr Turnbull is offering three technologies, FTTN, HFC and wireless. All of them are limited in their ability to provide Australia with the broadband that we need and are more importantly going to need in the near future. And in a recent analysis of Mr Turnbull's plan, Citigroup found, and I quote, the rapid speed demand growth observed in the past indicates that demand in Australia is likely to exceed the capabilities of what the coalition plan can deliver sooner rather than later, requiring nationwide upgrades to keep up. So let me just again remind you of the speed projections to which Citigroup is referring. You can see them there again. The NBN has an upgrade path well into the future to meet this demand. Now here is what Mr Turnbull has planned for Australia. He is planning a network that will be obsolete by the time it's built. He will leave us stranded and locked into today's speeds up until 2018, which is the earliest optimistic assessment of how quickly he'll build the network. And Mr Turnbull, well, he's decided there'll be no growth in demand for bandwidth. It just stops. He's got a network that just assumes that there's no one's going to want any more. All of the extraordinary growth in the internet data, the growing demand for download and upload capacity, that all ends today with Mr Turnbull's plan. There'll be no more innovation, the likes of Apple and Google. They're going to stop. No new products or applications from companies we've never even heard of yet. And according to Mr Turnbull, no one anywhere in the world is going to develop anything new. And how much will it cost to limit our future in the way I've just described? We don't know because Mr Turnbull hasn't costed it. He hasn't taken it to the shadow cabinet. He hasn't taken it to their shadow ERC committee. Mr Robb has not seen it. But we do have one independent costing. Citigroup, as I've mentioned, has priced Mr Turnbull's build at $16.7 billion. $16.7 billion on budget. On budget. This is not an investment. This is just straight on budget item. And that doesn't include Telstra's copper or structural separation and any cost to achieve that. The problem that Mr Turnbull has is that he has no plan to deliver structural separation, yet he does say he supports it, as you can see in the quotes. We support separation. We recognise that it would enhance competition 
and he says structural separation is the best outcome. I also think it's the best outcome for Telstra shareholders. Well, Mr Turnbull must know more about Telstra's interests than Telstra's board, its management and its shareholders over the past decade. Marco must think he's back advising Ray Williams about purchasing FAI for HIH because he knows best for Telstra shareholders. Well, fortunately, the management of Telstra is a bit smarter than Ray Williams. The fact is, Telstra has never contemplated voluntary structural separation without an incentive. We are left to trust that Mr Turnbull's own skills of persuasion will right the structural wrong left by the Howard government. And the worst part of Mr Turnbull's plan is how it abandons regional Australia. Under the NBN, wholesale prices are the same nationwide whether you live in the bush or the city. Yet he opposes the NBN's uniform wholesale pricing. You abandon that and you will entrench the digital divide that exists today between regional and metropolitan Australia. Mr Turnbull knows regional Australia will be facing higher costs. He advocates handing out vouchers directly to regional consumers. Vouchers. This is a shameful attempt to shroud the fact he will treat regional Australians as second class citizens. Under the NBN, 70% of regional Australia will receive fibre to the home. 70% of regional Australia. Places like Warrnambool, Goulburn, Mount Isa, Geraldton, Burnie, Mount Gambier will receive fibre to the home. The future for these towns under the opposition is not quite as clear. Two months ago, Tony Abbott dismissed fibre technology, saying, and I quote, it had already been bypassed by wireless. No, he's not Bill Gates. We know that again. According to him, wireless is all we need. But just last week, and some of you may not have had a chance to catch up with this, it's been a pretty exciting few days. Just last week, the Nationals released their 2011-12 policy. And guess what it called for? Fibre to over 50% of homes in regional Australia. Fibre to the home, more than 50%. Mr Turnbull continues to commit the coalition to provide FTTN and wireless in regional Australia. So there we have three different and conflicting policy positions. Mr Abbott is all for wireless, Mr Turnbull wants FTTN and a bit of wireless, and the National Party have decided that they want fibre to the home to 50% minimum. They want to go more than 50%. So there is only one certainty if you live in regional Australia. You will be dramatically better off under the Gillard government's NBN. But enough about their negativity. The truth is the NBN isn't about politics. It's about the future. The NBN is integral to the Gillard government's vision of Australia as a prosperous, egalitarian, inclusive and connected country. Like water, roads, rail and electricity, broadband is fundamentally important to the economic growth of all nations. Every month, a new study is released demonstrating broadband's economic benefits. For example, Deloitte Access Economics found the internet contributed $50 billion to Australia's economy in 2010, and they estimate that by 2015, the internet's contribution to our economy will increase to about $70 billion. The continuing growth of the digital economy is a positive development for Australia. It means our students will be able to take a chemistry or maths class taught by teachers in another city, it means our grandparents will live at home longer, monitored by nurses and families remotely. This will reduce pressure on health budgets. It means better services for the disabled and better opportunities to lead fulfilling lives. It means businesses will run more efficiently with greater collaboration and innovation. And they, they have improved access to new markets, all these small businesses, access to new markets around the country and the globe. Make no mistake, the digital world changes everything. Broadband is a profoundly disruptive development. It transforms, transforms virtually every sector in our economy, from healthcare and education to retail and media. Broadband is changing the world. I need not point out here its impact on the business models that support journalism. And online retailing is another prominent example of how businesses need to adapt. We've seen this with Amazon and iTunes. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. And here's an example just recently in South Korea. Today, you can shop in a Korean supermarket while walking through a subway station on the way to work. That's a subway station. 
Using your smartphone, you can scan the barcodes of products from virtual supermarket shelves displayed on the walls. Your completed order is transmitted back to a warehouse and delivered to your home that evening. That's just a picture. That's not real stock. That's a picture with barcodes. And this is just another example. Well, Labor believes in broadband because it is going to transform people's lives. We believe, just like universal superannuation, Medicare, that these are necessary for all Australians to have access to. And I wanted to finish with a quote. In a period in which we in Australia are still, I think, handicapped by parochialism, by a slight distrust of big ideas and of big people or of big enterprises, this scheme is teaching us and everybody in Australia to think in a big way, to be thankful for big things, to be proud of big enterprises. But who said that? That was Sir Robert Menzies in 1958 who after years of conservative opposition to the Snowy Mountain Scheme project ultimately embraced it. Well, the NBN is the big idea for our time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Conroy. We have time now for questions from our media members. The first one from David Crow. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, David Crowe from the Financial Review Minister. Uh, uh, I have two questions, and the first one is on the NBN. Um, it's, on, uh, <laughs> it's on the fact that the ACCC last week pushed back against uh, an NBN co-proposal that would limit the right of Telstra and Optus to market wireless. Now, the business case for the NBN down here says that it assumes 13% of households would go with wireless instead of fibre. Now, surely that number's got to change if we can see Telstra and Optus market uh, wireless without, le without any leash on them. Second question is, um, is on uh, uh, media policy. It's about a year now since, um, uh, since you announced an anti-siphoning regime. We haven't seen legislation for that. When do you think the legislation is going to be out and who's to blame for the delay? Uh, look, on the first one, you're assuming there's been no replacement for the clause you've referred to. Uh, I think the contract, there's now contractual words which mirror the false and misleading uh, advertising section of the uh, Trade Practices Act, which just ensures that people can't try and pretend, otherwise we'll start seeing ads like Webhog about the capacities of wireless or HFC. So the assumption you make is that they've got rid of one thing and there's nothing replaced it, which isn't quite right. And ultimately, I think the NBN Co uh, board are confident and comfortable with uh, the way the contract is now written. In terms of the anti-siphoning list, this is a complex issue that we've resolved with the AFL. The legislation we would like to have seen into Parliament uh, or tabled at least by the end of this year. But at the request of a number of people who are still involved in negotiating various things, we circulated some drafts and they want to consult with us further. So we're very relaxed about the fact that we are consulting on this issue, probably more than uh, is usual, but it's a very complex area. We have interaction between live sporting rights taking place at the same time, so we've got to make sure we get it absolutely right. So we are very comfortable and relaxed that we are negotiating and continuing to iterate backwards and forwards to make sure we get the legislation right. It's better to get something this complex right than have to come back and try and amend it later. So we are very, very comfortable in the ongoing negotiations we've been having with all parties. Lauren Wilson. Lauren Wilson from the Australian Minister. Um, outgoing ABC Chairman Maurice Newman has said that the SBS should become a part of the ABC. Do you think that there is a strong economic case to be made to merge the two taxpayer-funded public broadcasters? Uh, Morris has long held this view. I think he said in the interview that he'd held it the first time he was on the board, he held it the second time he was on the board. He couldn't convince the Howard governments of the merits of it and we've never considered it and I have no plans whatsoever to consider it. Next question, uh, Clancy Yates. Clancy Yates from the Sydney Morning Herald. Minister, um, just last week the Productivity Commission uh, called on the government to commission an analysis of the, uh, the non-commercial benefits of the NBN. Now, I realise you've said before it wouldn't be possible to capture all the effects, but the Productivity Commission uh, clearly thinks it's plausible. If you're so confident of the NBN's many benefits, uh, 
why not try to quantify them? Yeah, now look, uh, I did see that report. Uh, just for those who didn't read it closely, it actually cleared the NBN Co of all of the uh, actual issues that were put to it by the proponents. It then went on to opine its view that 7% was too low a commercial rate of return. Let me be very clear, I reject this utterly. Uh, I often, when it comes to economists and tragically having an economics background, uh, I've lived, uh, lived in this debate for a long time. Uh, Three people on a desert island, a uh, physicist, uh, an engineer and an economist, and they've got a can of beans. How are they going to open it, the can of beans to eat before they starve? Physicists suggest we build a fire, eventually it'll burst open. The engineer devises a way to cut open. The economist starts off by saying, let's assume we've got a can opener. Welcome to dealing with the Productivity Commission. Let's assume <laughs> we've got a perfect world out there today. Let's assume we've got pure competition that exists in the marketplace today and then test it against the NBN model. Tragically, they don't seem to have noticed what's actually been happening for the last 15 years in the telecommunications sector. I said earlier, 90% of profits in this sector went to one company. 90%. Does that suggest that maybe perfect competition isn't working in the telecommunications sector. I think you've all heard me before say 150 disputes in this access disputes in this sector in 11 or 12 years compared to every other infrastructure program. Uh, they've had four in total, airports, gas, water, electricity, four in the same period, over 150 in the telecommunications sector. In the perfect world that the economists live in on that island, where they assume there's a can opener, it may be you could make an argument in one particular direction. But when you start from a structurally broken sector like we had, I think some of the underlying assumptions like raise your prices to people who live in regional Australia, we reject on a policy ground, they're unfair and they're inequitable. Inequitable, two words, one word that you won't ever hear, Productivity Commissioner Utter. Nick Butterley. Uh, Minister Nick Butterley from the West Australian. Um, can you explain exactly why two bids uh, for the Australian Network uh, recommendations that the Australian Network uh, be run by Sky News uh, were knocked on the head by Cabinet? Um, are we really to believe, as the Prime Minister said, that the uh, Arab Spring was partly to blame for one of those bids being killed off? And can you say what the size of the compensation package to Sky News will likely be? Uh, look, unfortunately, your question is based on a couple of false premises, and I've seen some people jumping on TV to froth up the mouth and uh, keep suggesting that's the case. If you look at what I've actually said in Parliament in a couple of statements, the process was ongoing. In both cases, there was no decisions. Now, the first one, the Arab Spring and a whole range of issues, uh, came up and we started again. And in the second one, there were serious leaks. Now, people keep saying, how on earth can it be the leak about what X or Y has said or recommended uh, is, corrupts the process? The corruption of the process is that the, there was leaks. And what the legal advice suggests is that if there are a leak here, you can't have any confidence in the process. It has been fundamentally compromised and somebody could take you to court and knock you over on the basis, well, if that leaked, something else could have leaked as well. Prudent response to legal advice. So people who keep claiming, as I've seen many do, the process was completed are wrong. We were still going through a process. I've said this a number of times. We were, I think I've said we were about to start a consultation phase with the two bidders to talk about some of the commercial terms. I've said that repeatedly, but apparently that can't be right because the process had completed. In terms of the compensation, well, that's a, a matter that uh, Sky will take up with my department, I'm sure, or with the Department of Foreign Affairs, and uh, I'm not going to uh, prejudice or reveal what the Commonwealth may or may not be willing to compensate or what the claim size will ultimately be. And Matt Johnson. Matt Johnston from the Herald Sun. Um, a parliamentary committee has recommended sweeping changes to uh, gambling advertising during the day, including during sports matches. I know you've moved to ask industries to self-regulate and um, some other changes. How do you think that's tracking? Do you think there's too much gambling ads on TV? And do you think legislation will be inevitable? And also, um, while we're on the topic, as a passionate Pies fan, do you think that uh, AFL clubs and other sporting groups should give up 
gambling sponsorship so that those images aren't broadcast to children? Yeah. Look, I think uh, you, you mentioned that I think we had a joint committee of all the ministers who handle uh, gambling and internet gambling uh, from around Australia. And there was a very, very strong response from that committee, which has been followed through, uh, that everyone is sick and tired of particularly the in-broadcast uh, gambling promotions. So, for instance, uh, commentators encouraging you to get online and bet, commentators telling you what the odds are. Uh, and I think the negotiations are moving along very well uh, with the sector to see that stopped. I think everyone ultimately wants it stopped. The one area where there's still discussion is the definition of in-play. Is in play quarter time if you're an AFL fan, half time if you're a rugby fan? Can you have some discussion of odds? The half time odds are X. That is an ongoing discussion to uh, just see if we can work through an agreement among all the states and ourselves. Equally, a number of the states have already moved, and, uh, and I've got to congratulate the MCC. Uh, they're taking back their contract, which allows a lot of uh, the promotions during the course of the game up on the big screen, uh, an announcement from the ground announcer, as well as distribution of material around the ground, both inside and outside. And they're moving to just do away with that. And I congratulate the AFL and the MCC for the steps they're taking on that. I completely support that. Having a situation where it's just shoved down people's throats, uh, when you take your kids to the, uh, the footy, either code, doesn't matter, or any of the sports, is just unhealthy. It's not the sort of culture we want to promote. In terms of uh, banning individual sponsorships on jumpers, I think that perhaps is going too far. We're particularly concerned about the intrusiveness of pushing it in. We've had a couple of examples of, I think, some of the soccer clubs, NSL clubs, uh, have accepted or considered accepting sponsorship from overseas internet gambling sites which are outside of our laws and I think ultimately they've moved away from that because what you're seeing at the moment is some very soft advertising to get you to come on sites and as you saw recently with I think Tilt Poker, uh, it was a Ponzi scheme, you put all your money in, you, you bet, you won and if you tried to take your money out it wasn't there. So I think people are learning that just because it's got a couple of well-known names attached to a, an internet gambling site, it's not necessarily safe. This was just a straight-up Ponzi scheme. Just took everyone's money and cleaned them out. So we do need better regulations, and we've referred off uh, to uh, one of the committees to look at recommendations about some of the internet gambling. Is it better to have a regulated process where people have some confidence that the company they're dealing with online is actually real, has substantial funds to be able to make payouts, uh, or do you stick with the no ban? So those are issues that are being discussed and debated. And uh, in terms of Collingwood, uh, I wore the, wore the latest jumper recently on TV. Uh, no, no, I won't sing, sorry. I've been banned. Uh, but I'm just trying to remember whether we've got any uh, online gambling or anything. I don't think we have. But it, as I said, banning jumpers on legitimate uh, companies, I'm not as excited, it doesn't worry as much as the sort of in your face pushing, shoving down people's throats. Paul Osborne. Uh, Paul Osborne from Australian Associated Press. Um, I too have a double barrelled question, two different questions. Yeah. The yeah, first is um, mentions being made of the Productivity Commission uh, report and also of the, um, the Australia Network uh, tender debacle. Um, and the fact it was undermined by leaks. I'd just like to know um, what, uh, what evidence is there that um, Australia is a relatively risk-free environment for investing? And I also note that um, the World Bank recently uh, ranked down Australia from 60 to 65th in terms of protecting investors as part of that. So what, uh, what evidence is there that Australia is a relatively risk-free place to do business? Uh, especially in the communication sector. And my second question relates to um, the role of the uh, leader of the government uh, business in the Senate. I was wondering whether you have any... Um, uh, sorry. That, that's Mark the, re the reshuffle, Mark sorry. Mark or uh, Joseph Ludwig? Uh, the Ludwig. Uh, right. 
the, the uh, impact on, on him as far as uh, business in the Senate uh, as part of the sure. reshuffle. Look, if I can start with that. I'm, Thank you. I actually think Joseph has been trying to give that job to me for years. Uh, and uh, I've managed to avoid it, and I've, I've very successfully managed to avoid it again. So good luck to Mark Arbib. But uh, I'm sure Joseph is not sitting at home crying that he lost the manager of government business in the Senate. Uh, he has honestly been trying to offload it for a long time. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, you know, think about it. Round, he's been, he spent his time rounding up uh, Nick Xenophon, Steve Fielding, the Greens, the Liberals, the Nationals. Imagine trying to round that up uh, as, a, as a career task. And that's what he was, he's done for years, success, very, very successfully. In terms of sovereign risk, I love the debate about sovereign risk. I have seen a new definition of sovereign, sovereign risk. It's asymmetrical. If a tax goes up, God, that is sovereign risk. But if a tax goes down, that's fucking fantastic, excuse me. That is fantastic. Uh, the complete hypocrisy on this debate around sovereign risk is staggering. Because apparently we've been engaging sovereign risk all these years every time we've lowered a business tax. So this is, this is completely, completely uh, a fictitious debate. Uh, and uh, I reject utterly these arguments about sovereign risk. Sovereign risk is what's going on possibly in some uh, European countries at the moment, governments can't pay their debts. Changing tax policy is not sovereign risk, because if it is, that means it's sovereign risk when you lower taxes. John Hilvert. Uh, John Hilvert, IT News Minister. Uh, I, was, I was very taken uh, and impressed by the importance you placed on uh, fixed line broadband and, it, and being a foundation for the future of the infrastructure. And also, I note that in your uh, digital strategy, your aim is to get Australia into the top five OECD countries um, in fixed broadband. And yet, um, the most recent six monthly ranking of OECD countries to June 2011 actually shows us slipping from 18th to the 21st. We've slipped behind New Zealand. Um, we're uh, behind Estonia, Israel and Austria. What is your plan to get us at least into the top 10 yeah. by 2020? No, look, I, I, one of the very reasons we're doing the NBN is because we don't want to slip any further. We are standing still. All these other countries are investing in new next generation networks. And that is why it is so important for us to take a step forward, not pretend that there's no huge boom in traffic huge boom in demand for access to the internet, both up and down. So we absolutely, we put out the digital economy paper. Uh, we, we don't want to be in the top 10. We want to be in the top five OECD countries in the proportion of households connected to broadband at home. We, uh, we put out our paper, it's online. We've got a whole range of trials taking place across the country in the first release sites. We've got tr health trials taking place in Armidale. We've, uh, you would have seen Warren Snowden just recently announced that we're uh, doing veterans trials at home. We've got education trials. We've got uh, diabetes trials taking place or about to start taking place. We've put all the funding in the budget. It's now starting to come on stream. Some of them are already underway. Some of them have just been announced. We've got digital hubs for councils that are, are going to be using uh, those first release sites, councils, where they're going training for small business, they've got training for citizens to come in. So we've got a whole raft of policies that there is funding for in this budget. Some of them we still actually haven't announced. Uh, there was one big number there and we've just been actually gradually announcing them through the year and we've got a few more to go in these sorts of areas that are all about making us in the top five of the OECD in all of these areas. Michael Keating. Michael Keating, Keating Media Minister. Will the Australian taxpayer have to rescue the NBN because prices for services have been set too low? And what's your opinion of the Productivity Commission's report saying the expected 7% uh, rate of return is unrealistic? Yeah, no, look, I think I, uh, I gave a few uh, comments this before. Uh, we, look, we reject it. We have got a, some of Australia's top business people on the board. They've produced a corporate plan. We had McKinsey's $25 million study before that, which shows this is not a white elephant. So I utterly reject this argument that it's a white elephant. I mean, I've had 
12 months of Malcolm telling everyone it's going to be too expensive, people were paying too much. Well, it was either a monopoly and they were paying too much or it was a white elephant. I mean, you it couldn't be both. But Malcolm got to run both of those arguments during the course of the year. So we've actually got serious business people who've engaged in a lengthy, lengthy proper corporate process to pull together a plan. And ultimately, what people keep ignoring is that we are decommissioning the copper network. If you're going to have a fixed line, you are virtually guaranteed to be using the national broadband network in the future as we decommission the, uh, decommission the copper network and move everybody onto the fibre network. Every new home in Australia in a, a, in a state of greater than 100 is fibre only now. That's law. There's no more copper being connected if you're in a, one of the larger uh, real estate developments. The smaller ones, they get copper in the short term and then as we come through their suburbs then they get connected to the fibre. But every new home is essentially going to end up fibre only. Every fixed line will be virtually 100% NBN. Very, might be, you know, very small numbers here and there. But essentially the business plan I believe is very solid and I support the work that's been put into it by the NBN board. We're getting close to time, but I will take three more questions. The next from David Spears. Uh, David Spears from Sky News. Minister, thanks for the address and for uh, uh, addressing, uh, introducing some new language to the uh, <laughs> National Press Club today. Sorry about that. I'd like to I'm go to, be the, in trouble. Um, <laughs> to the Australian network as well, if I could. Uh, just in the interest of transparency and uh, correcting some of the, the, the frothing at the mouth, as you put it, uh, will you release the recommendations of the tender panels? Uh, and well, will so you... they, they were not a completed process. Will you, will you release what the government received uh, at least? Look, the Auditor General, we called him in, said have a look at the process. So I'm sure the Auditor General will provide more than enough information. But do we intend to release uh, recommendations based on commercial and confidence information? No. But and, the, right. the process wasn't finished. And the legal advice that the government has received, there is precedent for legal advice to the government being released, most notably parts of it in the... Uh, 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 Malaysia solution uh, issue, uh, or at the very least, would, would you be able to clear up? Uh, was there clear advice and that legal advice to cancel the? Process? Clear enough that the cabinet felt that we were in a strong position to terminate the tender process based on that advice. So yes, we think it was clear enough. Uh, in terms of releasing all of it, uh, I appreciate you made reference to partial uh, with the Malaysia solution. No, I won't be following that precedent.